understand the uh, uh, the uh, nuances, uh, the textured issues uh, associated with a number of disciplines that come into come to bear here. And I also um, can do what we're going to be talking about today only by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and that includes giants like Cheryl, as, as well as people from health economics background, uh, people with uh, clinical, uh, clinical expertise, um, uh, biostatisticians, et cetera. So we're talking here about uh, something that's uh, quite novel. It's at the cusp of uh, uh, research in uh, public health. And I'm hoping to give you a glimpse of it. Um, I do teach a course uh, here on campus, which goes into this material more and is underway this semester. Um, and uh, anyone who's interested in learning more, I'd be glad to, glad to talk with you. So my understanding is we have about uh, two hours today. Is that rough? OK. So um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, uh, two broad sets of things. First, I'm going to be introducing um, some of the motivations for doing the sort of modeling uh, on which we work. Um, and uh, secondly, I'm going to be introducing some of the uh, tools we use, in particular the software we use to do this sort of modeling. This modeling is, is computational, meaning it, it leverages the power of computers. Um, in a similar way to some of the packages you probably will have used elsewhere in the School of Public Health, uh, for, for example, for your course in Biostats, I think you may have made use of uh, SPSS, is that right? Um, it would have been a lot more complicated, and a lot less fun to do those calculations by hand. And uh, similarly, the sort of work we're talking about here is uh, greatly leveraged by having computers available. The motivations for this work uh, lie in many ways in, in uh, on the one hand, the regularities we see in infectious disease processes. And on the other hand, the great complexities underlying those processes, and the large number of factors and their complex interactions that give rise to the patterns we see. So what I've uh, shown here is um, records from uh, uh, three different places, in this case, uh, London during the bubonic plague. Uh, in another case, uh, pertussis here, so whooping cough. Uh, in uh, England and then in Wales here. And this is showing over the scale of years here it's over the scale of weeks. And what we see here um, is a certain amount of, of structure or regularity, you know, sort of sudden rises and then collapses, whether on the scale of, of weeks or, or looked at repeatedly from the scale of years. And uh, yet we also see a, a lot of different confusing factors, why it's not uniform from year to year, why there's sort of a secondary piece uh, prior to, to the larger peak. Why is it the peak rises quickly, but then declines even more so? These are, these are interesting phenomena, and, and they're important phenomena. Um, uh, pertussis can have uh, very uh, severe side effects, particularly when acquired later in life. Uh, this, uh, this graph, which uh, is interesting from a mathematical point of view, um, attests to a lot of unnecessary cases of, of sickness, a lot of, a lot of human suffering involved. Now, these graphs, so we could, I could show similar graphs from here in Saskatchewan for measles or mumps or pertussis or chickenpox. We have similar graphs that, that we found, um, not on a weekly basis but on a monthly, that attest to similar patterns. And indeed, those patterns have been seen worldwide. There's a lot of complexity underlying those patterns. Uh, some of that complexity has to, has to do with delays. Um, there can be significant delays uh, between infection and the appearance of, of symptoms. Someone can go with, uh, have been infected by tuberculosis and not know about it for, for decades. An individual could be infected by flu and could be circulating for a day or two asymptomatically. And in fact, Shed, spreading it um, prior to developing uh, obvious flu-like symptoms. These delays are also play a role in the response of the healthcare system. So um, when uh, we try to prevent the spread of infection by launching what's called contact tracing, trying to find different people with whom an infected individual has been in contact, 
uh, there's often a significant delay. It can be a delay of months before we track down them, that, that person, which can allow the infection to spread uh, from that person if they are infectious. There's also complex interactions involved between different sorts of conditions. Uh, here on campus uh, this past summer, we had a workshop on the interaction of chronic and infectious diseases. And these are often two solitudes that are studied by different sets of researchers, funded by different agencies, and uh, which uh, maintain different journals, different conferences, and never the twain shall meet. But uh, increasingly, we recognize that there are really important interactions. Chronic disease can make a person more vulnerable. The presence of chronic disease can make a person more vulnerable, and sometimes dramatically more vulnerable, to infectious disease. Can anyone give an example of that? Diabetes. Yeah, diabetes, in a, in a significant way, um, can leave open a person for uh, easier infection by a wide variety of, of pathogens including very serious conditions such as tuberculosis. Uh, there can be, as well, uh, so that's an, it, diabetes is an interesting case because it has adverse immune impact. Uh, chronic kidney disease, as the sequelae of diabetes are independent of it, uh, also is known to significantly impair the immune system. In the reverse direction, infectious diseases can lead to chronic conditions. TB is classified as both an infectious and a chronic chronic disease, but there's other communicable con uh, conditions which can also give rise to, to uh, uh, chronic disease. It's, it's suspected, moreover, that there's additional ones out there. For example, people point to a Parkinson's um, as a uh, disease that may have uh, some infectious component, a certain forms of heart disease, etc. So we have this interaction going on between different conditions, and even between infectious conditions, Hep C and HIV, for example being a, a classic condition. Turns out that, that uh, the two interact, both for reasons of treatment and because of the underlying uh, etiology involved. Um, there can be accelerations of one condition for another, et cetera. And finally, we have uh, a set of, of uh, what are termed feedbacks. These are cases where a given change kicks into place a set of other changes that that ripple around and either amplify or push back against the, the original change. So um, our immune systems and our healthcare systems are designed to respond to uh, challenges. And uh, our immune system sometimes does a very good job of it, but it can lead to uh, bad consequences sometimes with things like cyto cytokine storms where our immune system is in, in a way uh, overreacting to our detriment. The healthcare system also responds to challenges, but it takes time to gear up for it, to formulate new policies, to marshal the resources, etc. Uh, people change their behavior. With the HIV epidemic in the US, there were pronounced changes of behavior um, in the years following the, uh, the rapid spread of HIV that lowered the risks associated um, with uh, contracting HIV. After the advent of antiretrovirals and their widespread availability, you see some of the same risk behavior starting to come out again. So uh, behavior change plays a big role in, in um, mediating the spread of, spread of infection. And that's associated with risk perception uh, as well. Factors are also nonlinear, and that's a fancy term, and people use it in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, one of the ways that people sometimes use is meaning their feedbacks is this kind of uh, uh, circular causality where, where uh, say, one person getting infected can infect additional ones, which even leads to more people getting infected, um, and then spreading the infection further, and a kind of a snowballing effect. But there's another use of it, too, which means that there's um, non-obvious interactions. For example, if we launch two programs at once, uh, two interventions, for example, to lower the burden of infection, maybe it's um, uh, aggressive contact tracing, and it's um, a strong program of advisories. Uh, maybe it's quarantining on the one hand, and, um, and uh, attempts to uh, allow for easier uh, hygienic purposes by installing um, installing uh, the, the hand washes uh, in places. 
these things can interact in non-obvious ways. You can't, you can't count the benefits of one and independently of benefits of the other and assume that the benefits of both together will be the sum of those. They could work together in a synergistic way, so you get a lot bigger effects by combining them. Or they could work across purposes in some cases. So the effects of combining them are less than the effects of either of them independently. You can get these, these types of effects. And Taken together, these complexities really bedevil our, our planning in the public health area. Another, another big issue is heterogeneity. Um, there's, there's very pronounced differences in individual behavior we see out there in the world. And, uh, and that lends itself to differences in between, between groups as well. So this is a graph of the number of partners individuals have over a one year period from one study of STIs. Uh, and for both uh, uh, same-sex and um, uh, opposite-sex partnerships. And what you can see is that while most individuals are clustered down in the, with, with fewer partners, there are some which have lots of partners, and especially when you look at the, the same-sex um, uh, context. Now, all of these uh, issues need to be taken into account if we're to affect real change. Um, my colleague Bobby Milstein at the uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control talks about public health as seeking to redirect the course of change, seeking to improve things for the better uh, in, the, in the world in terms of the health burdens that are out there. And it's a laudable goal and uh, one that has a lot of intellectual foundation behind it. But it's one that, that has a lot of challenges too when it comes to practically deciding what programs, what interventions we wish to put into place. It can have big successes and it can have setbacks. Um, in this case, we see a number of reports of uh, chlamydia over time uh, from the early 1990s. Um, whoa, my glasses are causing me trouble today. Well, unfortunately, I'm not legally blind. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> So uh, what we see is a decline in the number of, uh, of individuals reported to have chlamydia uh, over time. And this was in the context of really big efforts uh, on, in the form of more aggressive contact tracing, in the form of getting information out there on the risks associated with chlamydia, some advances in terms of um, prenatal testing, et cetera. And those uh, at the Public Health Agency of Canada and elsewhere have been really um, concerned about the fact that those gains didn't last. Even though better programs were put in place, there's learning going on about what works and what doesn't work, we see a, a quite dramatic rise in the number of reported cases. This is a case that many have, have uh, greeted with alarm, saying that we're in a crisis mode with chlamydia. Others have looked at these same patterns and questioned, well, maybe this is a reflection of something else. Maybe it's a reflection of the sensitivity of the specificity of the tests involved, because there was a change in testing regimen. Maybe it's a, it's a function largely of the amount of testing that's going on. Interpreting this and turning that interpretation into action to further lower the burden of chlamydia is really challenging. There's a lot of different factors. Individual behavior changes, which have been observed over this time, uh, potential immune system impacts. People have argued that maybe this rise is because we're treating people too quickly. That sounds great. You quickly treat people, but they're saying maybe what's going on is we're treating people quickly so their immune system doesn't get a chance to build up a defense to it, and then we're throwing them back into their same sexual networks they were in, probably with another infected person, and they get infected again quickly. And so we got rapid reinfections. Maybe that's what's going on. Others say, no, it's you know, the volume of testing or it's sensitive especially. There's a lot of factors in here. A lot of factors. And to decide how to go forward, we want to make sense of this with all these factors together. So these, these complexities, they matter for making choices, for making decisions. Now, you have uh, been exposed in your classes, no doubt, to a variety of very powerful um, and uh, very long-standing 
methods which have been introduced into uh, epidemiology, which are by and large based in biostatistics. Um, epidemiology owes a great deal to, um, to insights from the biostatistical area. Uh, and uh, there's a variety of, of very powerful techniques, uh, many of them grounded in, in uh, regression and hypothesis testing that have been brought to bear on interpreting um, epidemiological data. And, th and these techniques have much to offer. And indeed, they work hand in hand with the sort of models that we're discussing today. But they do have some real uh, limitations when used alone in understanding the sort of effects we're talking about. And um, some quite prominent epidemiologists have commented on some of these limitations. And I, I put up some of their uh, comments here. But you know, one of them has to do with just the sheer diversity of the large numbers of, of interacting factors and the, and the fact that those interactions are often not just unidirectional. But one thing increases uh, another, but they're bidirectional. They influence each other. And when it comes time to understand the association even, just purely the association between one thing and another, these bidirectional interactions can be really tricky. So, for example, we know that smoking <coughs> and diabetes uh, are both risk factors uh, for TB, for TB infection, as well as for active TB disease. But we don't but there's a further consideration, which is that our chance of developing, getting infected with TB, and subsequently developing active TB, um, also depends on the uh, people we hang around with. If we're hanging around with people who, who have a greater uh, burden of, of active TB, we're more likely to get infected. But we can't look at these, uh, at these associations independently of one another, because who we hang around with shapes whether we're a smoker, and the fact that we're a smoker shapes who we hang around with also. There's bi-directional interactions there. The fact that we have diabetes may lead us, for example, if we're, we're in later stages of kidney disease, to spend a lot of time around other people who have, who have diabetes. So we have these bi-directional interactions which get in the way of, of straightforward analysis. Um, you may have heard of the, the uh, assumption, the stable unit treatment value assumption. That comes really into question with, with a lot of these complex relationships. And then we have these relationships between variables that aren't at all straightforward. There are delays associated with them. So sure, x has an effect on y, but it has an effect only slowly at first and then more rapidly later. It's a time varying effect based on the time in the a person's life force, or it's discontinuous. It, it's a very small effect early on, and then it's, um, then it's a large effect, uh, depending on the value of, of that. So we're dealing here with epidemiology and understanding a very complex system. And often, we're frustrated because we only get pieces of it that, that we can see at any given time. And there's a lot of effort that goes into discussing and analyzing each of the pieces um, in isolation. And what we're talking about in modeling is putting together all these pieces to understand more clearly the underlying processes that, that give rise to them all. What's the underlying factor that, that connects, all the underlying processes that connect all the different pieces we're looking at? Here we may be studying the ear, and we may spend a lot of time arguing about the, the orientation of the ear, these other people arguing about the trunk or the tail, and, and yet they're all talking about different pieces of the same underlying elephant. And there can be a lot of heat and less light generated uh, if we look at these pieces in isolation than if we look at, at the broader system that gives rise to them. So here in epidemiology, we see um, a lot of different time series that result from the same underlying process. Uh, in this case, we have type 2 diabetes from administrative data here in Saskatchewan. Uh, work I've had the privilege of doing with Roland Dick in the School of Medicine here. And uh, what we see is uh, a variety of related factors um, that bear on, on diabetes. So, so we have diabetes incidence, for example. We have end-stage renal disease incidence, uh, end-stage renal disease 
uh, deaths, type 2 diabetes deaths, type 2 diabetes prevalence. All of these are different, different pieces of the elephant, so to speak. There's something that's giving rise to them. And similarly, if we look at something like uh, tuberculosis, closer to the, uh, to the goals of this class, we see a wide variety of data about tuberculosis. In this case, a uh, sanitary patient case from earlier in the, in the uh, 1900s. We see um, the number of, of cases of tuberculosis and the number of deaths from tuberculosis over time. Again, all, all resulting from some underlying factors, this, this associated with STIs. So the, the idea behind a lot of the modeling um, the dynamic modeling that we do is that these pieces all result from some underlying system. And rather than treating them in isolation statistically, trying to find associations within them, analyzing each as a world unto itself, we try to make sense of these pieces um, by talking about the underlying system that gives rise to all of them and use each of them in a sort of form of triangulation to understand what's going on in that underlying system. And we do that so we can know how, among other things, how if we change a certain thing in the system, change what intervention we have in place, change the, the means by which we do contact tracing, change our testing methodology, how would that change things? How would it improve things, hopefully? Okay, so, so we're talking here about seeking to understand the underlying processes that give rise to the patterns that we see. So these time series that we've been talking about, for example, there for STIs or earlier for diabetes and TB, they're tightly interrelated, they're not independent. Um, many of the features of them are driven by the same underlying processes, and these may involve things as diverse as the natural history of infection, demographic change, the presence of immigration or of uh, uh, birth rates, uh, death rates, uh, etc. Um, mechanisms of infection transmission for the case of uh, uh, communicable disease. Uh, risk behavior and risk perception, health system response. These things are tangled up together. If more individuals are dying, it may lower the prevalence. Taken in isolation, a lower prevalence may look good. It may look like you've made some progress. But if you realize that's, that's due to higher death rate, it doesn't look so good. Conversely, uh, higher birth rates may, may affect your, your system in some unexpected ways. They could lower the crude rates of diabetes at birth because we have a more youth-centered population, but could end up yielding to some unexpected interactions down the road. So simulation, and doing this sort of simulation we'll be seeing in just a few moments here, we're seeking insight from characterizing how this underlying system works. We're talking about, we're trying to articulate, make explicit so we can critique, understanding about how the world works. Taking our focus away for the moment from the observations of the underlying world, which are just the tip of the iceberg, and seeking to articulate in a clear, unambiguous way hypotheses about how things may be working that give rise to those patterns, to talk about that underlying element. Um, now, much of this is driven by the desire to ask what if questions. If we were to change a certain thing, how would it, how would it affect the, uh, the system? So simulation models here can be viewed as dynamic hypotheses concerning what's going on out there in the world. They're different, very different from a statistical model in that sense. They're all about talking about what is changing what and in what way. How is it, how do things work out there? And we're seeking to understand that, to understand counterfactuals. If we change this, what would the difference be? What would we expect to see in, in terms of all those different observables, for example? What would we expect to see in terms of things we can't directly observe, but which are really important, like the underlying incidence of infection? We may know that there's lots of undiagnosed diabetes out there, or there's lots of cases of chlamydia that are asymptomatic, that are important because they spread. And these models allow us to, to ask questions about how would our policies, policy, 
this type or that type, we changed our contact tracing protocol. How would that lower the burden, say, of, of asymptomatic uh, asymptomatic SDIs? And how would that ripple through to uh, what would we expect in terms of the observed cases of what people present for uh, for chlamydia? Okay, so so simulation models here are are a description of of what's going on out there. They're, and we articulate this description in, in, in a mathematical way. Now that doesn't mean we sit around writing Greek symbols all day, although that, that's uh, uh, a habit uh, that's fond for some of my colleagues. Um, but uh, what we try to do is to describe these things in a way that's, that's quite transparent. Actually, it's quite graphical. Uh, and we try to then use those models to reason about what we actually see over time. These are dynamic models, um, not because they're excited and jump around a lot, uh, but because they, they run out over time. They, they describe how things change over time. They don't provide a fixed form for saying it has to change in a certain way, uh, the certain shape of the curve. The curve shapes emerge from the model and what we call an emergent, uh, emergent behavior. We don't program in that it starts going uh, slowly and then it rises rapidly. That's something that comes out of the interaction of a lot of pieces in these models. Pieces that have to do with things like the interaction of all these different factors here. Okay, so, so we built these models and this is a depiction of, of, of one particular one involving diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And that gives rise to, uh, to results. At different pieces of the model, these correspond to different observables within the system. And we can fit data to them, try to get the model to reproduce data that's observed. And a really good model should be able to reproduce data that we didn't tell it about. So we tell it about some of the data, not others, and it can reproduce the data that, that we, we never let it know about. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, some example uh, models, and I'm, I'd like to step through the creation of the model. Um, I have more models than you could shake a stick at um, that I could show, but I, I thought it would be uh, more fruitful, and, and Cheryl uh, suggested the idea of, well, why not show this in action? Show, uh, show the building of models as a, uh, as a live model. So I, I think we're going to uh, to do that. Now I may throw in from slide to uh, from time to time a few slides, and I'm going to skip forward here um, to show. This is going to be the sort of model we build, and we're going to be running it and get some output like that. Now um, we're going to explain some of the pieces that go into this model over time, and we'll try to make sense of what we see. Okay, so what stands before you on the screen? is a software package known as, as Benson. And um, this is a uh, uh, package which is uh, part of a, a class of packages known as uh, system dynamic simulation models. That's a, a name for the sort of modeling that we're going to be doing. And the sort of, uh, it's associated with the sort of graphical language we'll see. So um, when we uh, build a model like this, we uh, have can actually build it in, in different ways. What we're going to be focusing on here is a simulation model, so one that's quantitative. And um, the first thing we often begin with in this context is asking about uh, the system that we're trying to capture. What is it we're interested in explaining, or what's the research question we're seeking to address? And I'm going to assume here that we'd like to gain an understanding of um, the change in, um, on, in uh, the fraction of, of, uh, of individuals who are infective over time. And we'd like to understand how interventions might affect that and how different externalities, such as uh, presence of immigration or higher birth rates, might affect that. And maybe if we have time, vaccination. So what we're going to do here is we go uh, file here. So this is what happens when you get into the software. There ain't no model. From you, so you have to say, hey, new model. Um, and it's going to ask you some things which we're going to come back to. Uh, 
But you'll notice we could choose sort of the time unit. Do we want to simulate things in the span of hours, seconds, days, weeks? This will depend on your model. If you're building a model of the immune system's response to an acute infection, you might want to simulate on the order of minutes. Um, in our case, I think we'll uh, stick with um, months. That should be fine. Now, uh, we could specify a particular time. We could have the model start, for example, at a, at a certain month. So I'm going to leave it just so it's between 0 and 100, um, knowing that, that you could adjust it. If you wanted to do it in years, you could make it start at 1990 and go to 2000, you know, 2020 or what have you. Okay. So what stands before us is sort of a canvas on which we will, uh, we will draw our, our model. So um, we're going to be here conceptualizing a model of a uh, population. Initially, it's going to be a closed population, or fairly close. Imagine, think of a population um, in a larger secondary school with, uh, that's a boarding school, so that most individuals stay with, within the school. Um, we're going to look at the impact of opening it up uh, uh, later. Okay, so. One of the first things we're going to be thinking about is uh, what are the different groups of individuals in that, in that school? What, what, what sorts of individuals might there be that, are, that bear on the spread of infection? And I'm going to assume in this case that we're going to have a, uh, an infection where we can simply divide individuals into three categories, susceptibles, people are susceptible people who are infected and infective at the same time than people who are recovered from infection. We can relax these assumptions and have people who are infected but not yet infective. And uh, if there's student interest, we can, we can do that later. But just to, to start simple, I'm going to um, just divide into those categories. So what I'm going to do here is that you have a kind of a, a palette up here. Um, and I'm going to choose this thing that says box variable level. Okay, that's going to represent a group of people into whom we wrote this population. Susceptible, infected, recovered. And I'm going to type out the word, so I clicked on that, and then I clicked on here. I'm going to type out the word susceptibles, okay? Okay, so there's our class of, of susceptibles. And then we're going to, again, staying in this mode, we're going to go over here and type infective. And then we're going to, over here, type uh, recovered. Okay. Maybe we'll just say recovered. And I'm going to go back, and you can actually just click on this and, and uh, eliminate the E, just so we stay kind of consistent. Now, those are all um, kind of uh, at different levels. So I just clicked over here at the hand to, to arrange them. Okay. So it almost looks like we're, we're drawing something in a, in a painting package or something. but. These are the building blocks of our model. So we're going to be classifying the population at any given time. People are going to be in one of three states. They're going to be either susceptible, infected, or, or recovered. Okay? Again, we can elaborate this until we have thousands of stocks. But let's, let's start simple for the purpose of illustrating how we build these models. Okay. So uh, this is our class. If people at any given time are in, this, in one of these categories, how do they move between categories? Uh, what, what sort of word would you use to describe it if someone um, is susceptible and they become infected? They become infective. Those are what? New infections, right? You could say it that way. No? Um, so in order to move between these categories, we need a different sort of thing, a different sort of variable. These are all variables. Um, they ain't Greek symbols, and they look more friendly than many variables you would have seen on, on math exams. But they're variables. They're going to change over time. But the computer is actually going to take keep track of how these change over time. The only way these things are going to change, you're going to tell them what their initial value is. And the only way they're going to change after that is through what are called flows. These are how these box variables, these so-called stocks, change over time. They change only through flows. You don't have to give any equation for how these change. It's 
determined by what flows come in and what flows go out, okay? So uh, there's going to be flows here, and, and uh, there's going to be one flow, and I've gone up here, it says rate, which is another name for flow, and I click on susceptible and I click on infected. And I'm going to say new infections, okay? That's what we're going to call it, new infections, okay? So that symbol indicates that people can go from susceptible to infected, and actually they can negative, they can go the other way. But that's how they move between those categories. So at any given time, a person is either here, here, or here, but they can move around over time, okay? You can change what, in what stock they're, they're located. Okay, um, so that's new infections. And then we have a similar flow. We're gonna, can anyone tell me where, where would another flow go? Sorry? Okay, yeah, so, so maybe this is an infection where an individual needs to be treated to recover. So they can't clear it naturally, right? Um, so there might be treatment-mediated infection between <coughs> infectives and, and recoveries. Okay, so let's, let's, let's call it treatments, right? Um, so that's another treatment. So when an individual gets treated, they move from here to here. Okay, um, since we're dealing with a closed population for the moment, we're going to assume no births and deaths, okay? So uh, where would births come into this, do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, unless there was something like vertical transmission from a mother or something, you're going to have people flowing in here to susceptibles. Where would deaths, where would deaths occur? Let's, let's assume this is a non-life-threatening illness, so it's not... Um, it's not all coming just from people who are infected. Where where might the um, where might deaths come from? Sorry. Either you have treated or infected. Okay. Well, yeah, you could have if you have pathogen induced death. It could come from here. But in general, if we're dealing, if we want to simulate this over the course of years and so on, where would, might people die from? Any any of. So there might be a death flow here, deaths of susceptibles, deaths of infections, and deaths of recoveries, right? Um, yeah, we could, uh, we could easily have that. In fact, um, what the heck? Let's just put that in. I mean, it's, it's straightforward. Okay, so um, I'm going to click here, and I'm going to click there, and I'm going to say deaths of susceptibles, okay? Hmm? Now, what you see at the end of this may be a bit puzzling to you. Um, but it's a little cloud, and basically that means that when someone flows down there, we're not going to keep track of them anymore. They've left them all. Now, a colleague of mine noted that the cloud has an undue resemblance to Australia, minus the Cape York Peninsula. <laughs> and uh, we noted that for a death flow, it, it's not inappropriate since you could view it as someone going down under. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... That's neither here nor there. Okay, so we're going to have deaths of infectives too. Um, deaths of infectives, uh, and we're going to ooh, whoa, oh man, hey, oh, don't give me that. Um, let me let me just go click on this thing, and I can go edit this. Okay, there we go. Um, and then we're going to have deaths of recovered. Uh, deaths of recovered. Okay, um, and. Then, I mean, if we're going to have deaths, we might as well have births. So I'm going to have births, births into here. Okay? Um, okay. So there it stands before us, um, a fine model. Now, depending on the pathogen of, of interest, you, you could have an additional flow between recovered and susceptible if you, people lose immunity. An example of this would be uh, uh, gonorrhea or indeed uh, chlamydia, uh, where it's believed that, that individuals, well, no, that individuals can get infected many times. And there's biologic reasons that differ for different pathogens. For flu, there's a very high rate of mutation. HIV, there's a bunch of, of textured reasons, including mutation rate and, and immune system, well, immune, uh, HIV infections like lung, but uh, with uh, chlamydia, there's uh, believed to be some biologic mechanisms well, but suffice it to say that um, that there could be a, a flow uh, back there. Okay, um, 
uh, and in gonorrhea, there's an outer membrane protein that evolves. Do I want to save this sketch? Yeah. Um, so let's let's save this. And it's uh, taking a while, but okay. Let's let's go to this one here, and uh, we are starting a fresh model here. Okay, so we're gonna save version one. Okay, there there it stands before. So now it's saved. Okay. Um, now, can I run this thing? Do you think? I think I could just go tell it. Okay, run. Could I? Could I do that? I think that wouldn't. Are there? Is there something missing? Sorry. I guess it's not complete. No, it's not completed, right? Yeah. Uh, among other things, I even told it how many people to assume are. It's simulating over time. It needs to know how many people are at least initially in each of these stocks. And then after that, it's determined by this flow. But it also needs something to know something about how, say, the number of treatments depends on the number of infected people. After all, if there's no infected people, no one to treat, and this, then there's going to be no treatment. If there's a lot of infected, presumably there'll be more treatments. Similarly, if there's no infectives, what other flow would have to be zero? There's no, there's no one here. What flow would, would be zero? Yeah, there's, there's, there's no treatment anymore. What other flow? Yeah, no infection. So, so certainly these two flows would have to be zero. There ain't no one to die, there's no one gonna die, right? Um, uh, ain't no one to be treated, there's no one gonna be treated. Um, but but more interestingly, if there's no infected, there shouldn't be any new infections, right? I mean, after all, there's no one to, to spread it around. <coughs> um, but interestingly, this is a new infectious is also going to be zero if what other thing is zero? Susceptible. So if there's no one who can get infected, there's no one who will be infected. So this flow is a little bit different. I mean. Each of these flows here, you know, if the thing they're flowing out of is zero, you can't have a flow out of it. But here, new infections, the effectives are zero. New infections got to be zero, and the thing is flowing out of it is zero. It's also got to be zero. So we've got to kind of tell it how much to assume for these flows. And this one's going to, this new infections is going to be a bit more textured. Okay. okay. So let's, let's take a look. We're going to introduce now, we're going to fill in the missing pieces. The easiest one to fill in is how many people start in each category. Okay? We're going we're gonna to do that. So what we're going to say is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. Uh, I could do it at, at two different levels. Um, yeah, let's, 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 okay, I click on this. This looks like a, looks like a chi-squared or something. Um, it's actually not. It just says go into an equation mode, and then it shows me it shows me black signs where there's missing pieces. Mm -hmm. So it's saying feed me, feed me equations. Okay. Um, so so now that we're in this mode, we have to tell it like okay what to assume in terms of number of deaths, etc. Okay, so we're gonna do this. Now, first thing is we're gonna we're gonna first tell it how many people are in each uh, of these states. So I'm gonna susceptible. And I'm gonna do something that that um, uh, we're gonna generalize in just a moment. I'm gonna say let's suppose there's a thousand people in the whole population. I'm gonna say 999 of them start in susceptible, and I click here on effectives. See this initial value? I should have emphasized it. This initial value here, that's that's where we tell it how many people start. We don't have to fill out anything else. This is all written for us. It just depends what flows are there. It just tells it the initial value. We're going to start with one, one infective, OK? And we're going to start with no recoveries. Zero, OK? Zero recoveries. OK. Um, now, that would be a fine model. And, and actually, we could go and we can make this model work straightforwardly. But there's something in me that revolts against that. Um, and I'm going to make it a little bit more general. I'm going to say here, I'm going to say initial population. This is, I'm creating a new variable. And it's neither a stock nor a flow. It's just 
it's a nice convenience name for a value I could have put in numerically. So, or a formula I could have put in. So I'm gonna see this, click this thing here, variable, and I'm gonna click there, and I'm going to say uh, initial population, okay? That's gonna be the size of the initial population. And I'm gonna set its value to be 1,000. Oh, oh, I said 100, but uh, 1,000. Yeah? Okay, okay. Now, click on susceptible, and instead of being 999, I'm gonna make it, and it's not, it's not down here, I'm gonna choose variable initial population, okay, minus one. Now, I actually should be, um, yeah, no, well, that's fine, okay. Um, and for infectives, I'm gonna leave it as one, and the other one I'm gonna leave as, as zero, okay? So now if I change the initial population from a thousand to a million, automatically this guy gets appropriately, uh, appropriately updated and it's, it's explicit, it's not hidden in some corner here, it's, it's a very long name. So I can, I can be very explicit about what my assumptions are. Okay, um, that's just a bit of hygiene. Okay, now let's, now let's fill in the rest. Now we've done the easy work, so to speak. Told it where to start out. Okay, after that, so at the initial time, in this case is zero, we didn't change that. Could have been 1990 or whatever, but the initial time, we'll have 999 people here, one here, and zero here. After that, these stocks will change as driven by the flow. So uh, let's, let's take the recovered stock. If there's more people coming in per month than leave, because of deaths, in other words, if there's more treatments per month than deaths, this stock will be going up. Kind of like a bathtub, you have more water coming in than going up during the drain, it's gonna back up. On the other hand, if there's a greater number of deaths than treatments, for example, if there's no infectives anymore and all there is is deaths, this stock is gonna be going down over time. So the, the, uh, movements of those stocks, if we want to be fancy about it, say the dynamics of those stocks, um, their changes over time are, are dictated by the rates of the flows in and out of them. And we don't have to describe any fancy equations for the stocks because they're described by the flows. What we do have to do is give some formulas for the flows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, this, uh, we're gonna get down to the business, that business, and it's not gonna be uh, totally trivial because of, uh, there's some learning involved, but also because there's some, some texture associated with these new infections. But it's not terribly hard either. How many people here have used Excel before? Okay. Um, how many people have used formulas in Excel? Like this cell is one over that other cell, or this one is this one divided by that. Okay. What you're, when you're building these models, you're doing something quite like that. You're it's like specifying formulas in Excel. Except you can name you name things instead of saying A fifteen divided by B thirty three. You say you say you know uh, uh, the number infected divided by the total population. So, but it's quite similar in the sense that you're you're not writing a computer program in in a traditional sense. You're just you're just saying this divided by that. You're giving small formulas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good, and um, yeah, it, it, so so that that sounds great. Yeah, hopefully not too many people will run away. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take one door. You take another one, Cheryl. He hasn't pulled up the calculus yet. So five five minutes more or less, and we'll be back. Okay, uh, great. So um, where we left this off was. Uh, we need to fill in some values of flows. So what we're going to do here is <coughs> concrete these flows one by one. And we'll leave, leave the most textured one, the one involving the infections, to the last. Okay? Because that 
is going to need to involve at some level both susceptibles and factors. The others, it turns out, will involve just one stock. So, so let's start with deaths, okay? So we're going to have a mortality rate. And uh, for now, we'll assume the mortality rate is the same, that, that the infection, uh, while it may burden people's health status, that it doesn't directly increase the, uh, the mortality rate when someone's infective. That's easy to change the assumption, but for, for simplicity, we'll, we'll keep this as a, a single mortality rate. And what we do here is we created a variable called mortality rate using this variable up there, click there, call it mortality rate. And then I need to, and then I'm going to do is I'm going to link it up to these others. Now, if you get the free version of NSIM, it's actually really picky about this. It, before you can refer to a variable or before you can choose it, it has to have a link to it. So um, I just linked mortality rate to these. What this means is that, for example, this blue arrow for mortality on the one hand, deaths have recovered on the other. Uh, that blue arrow reflects the fact that deaths have recovered is going to depend on mortality rate. That if we change mortality rate, deaths have recovered will change. All of the things being equal. And uh, so, so that's one thing in which deaths have recovered will depend. What the number of people dying per month will depend on this monthly mortality rate. But if we're considering deaths have recovered, what other variable will it depend on? On what other variable will it? Depend? Consider the number of people dying per month. Will it depend on uh, who are recovered? Will it depend on the number of susceptibles? No. What what variable will this depend on, based on the argument I made earlier? So if we consider the number of people who are dying, the recovered people who are dying, what variable must it depend on? Okay. So those those in fact it's only through treatments that become recovered. But they're, you're getting close, so this, this, this has got to depend on the number of recovered people. If there's no one here to recover, there's going to be no recoveries going on. The number of recoveries per month will be zero. So it's got to depend on the number of recovered. So, okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to again take this, this blue uh, arrow, we're going to click there, and click between recovered and, and deaths of recovered. So, so it's going to turn out that if we have more people who are recovered, all of the things being equal, the mortality rate being equal, the deaths of recovered, there'll be more of them recovering a month. If there's fewer of them, there's zero of them, fewer deaths of recovered. So by the same token, deaths of infectives will depend on what? Infectives. Deaths of susceptibles will depend on susceptibles. So, so let's hitch those up, and then we're we're going to be in good shape for uh, for uh, getting the equations written. Okay, so we have that, and I'm going to just just because I'm I'm pedantic about it, I'm going to well, uh, no, it's actually for clarity. Uh, where it says mortality rate, I'm going to say monthly mortality rate. Okay, just be very clear because we're counting things in months here. We want to be clear. We're not putting in a yearly mortality rate. And then commuting the number of people dying per month based on that directly. Okay, so we're going to say monthly mortality, just to keep it in our minds, right? Okay, now let's go back to equation mode. It's still complaining, okay, these things have to be filled in. Okay, monthly mortality, I'm going to give it a low monthly mortality rate, like 0.1%, okay? Um, I could have, we could estimate that for months. And indeed, our models have really solid data based on vital statistics. But for now, um, that, that will be fine. Um, and, uh, and for deaths that recovered, I'm going to, if we consider how many people are going, how many recovered people are going to die per month, we're going to take the number of recovered and multiply it by the monthly mortality rate. So if the monthly mortality rate, let's Let's imagine it were 10%, some ghastly level of mortality. If we had 10% of the population dying per month, of recovered dying per month, and we had 100 recovered people, how many people would die in that first month? 10, no, 10 percent of 100, 100 over 10, which is 10. So, 
So it's just going to be the number of recovered, 100, say, times the monthly mortality rate, say 10%, right? That's the number of people that will die per month. And that's, that's, what, that, that's what that formula gives, number of people dying per month, okay? So when we see deaths are recovered and that is a value of 10, that means 10 people per month, okay? Same thing with deaths of infected and deaths of susceptible. So we can just go fill them in directly using the same, same reasoning. Okay? So uh, infectives ta number of infectives times the monthly mortality rate for, for them. Um, and then uh, deaths of susceptibles is just susceptibles times the monthly mortality rate. It's worth pausing just to, as a sanity check, um, if monthly mortality rate were zero, there'd be no deaths of susceptibles. Yeah. If the number of susceptibles were zero, there'd be no deaths of susceptibles. Yeah, that makes sense. So just it's not a proof, but it's a it's a sanity check that what we're putting in there makes sense. Okay. So so we're we're about halfway there. We cleared up three and four of the things where it was complaining. Okay. Um Let's, let's next do treatments, okay? Um, so, so treatments here. Let's suppose that I have here a uh, mean time until treated, okay? Um, I'm, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack on this just so you can see a little bit of reasoning. I could have had a you know, monthly treatment fraction, what fraction of infected people are treated per month, and, and just multiply infectives by that to get the <coughs> treatments per month. But I'm going to do it actually this way. Yeah, it's a mean time until treated, okay? And suppose I say that it's, it's uh, one month, okay? So it's going to be one month before someone is treated. That's a time. Now I'm going to create a formula for this. So the number of treatments, the number of treat treatments given per month, what is that going to depend on as a stock? So if I consider how many people are getting treated per month, what must it depend on to be sensible? It's got to depend on effective. Yeah. So again, if this is zero, you're not going to have treatments going on. Um, so if there's no one to be treated, um, you're not going to you're not going to have treatments going on. It also is going to depend, it turns out, on the meantime until treated. Um, so if it's a long, let's suppose we have 10 people who are infected, and it takes a really long time to deliver treatment to them, say a year, the number that are getting treated per month is quite small. Right? Less than one per month. It's going to be 10 people over the course of Year. So, but meanwhile, if you have them all treated, then, then the number being treated per month would be quite high because it would be 10 people and they're all getting treated in the first month. So, you know, I mean, 10 people within the first month alone. So, so it actually is going to depend on this. Now, the formula for this, um, I discussed this in my class, but suffice it to say, that it's correct to treat it as this. So, so the number of people getting treated per month is the number of infectives. It depends directly on that. If there's zero infectives, zero people getting treated per month, and divided by the mean time until treated. So the bigger the mean time until treated, one year, two years, five years, the fewer and fewer people per month will be going down getting treated. Okay. So this is what we were saying. This big fewer people per month getting treatment. This is small, and more people per month getting treatment. It turns out that's the, that's the formula. And there's a, there's a good reason for that based on theory that we don't have time to go into, into here. But, okay, there we go. Okay, so all we have is two things left. Yes? I must be missing something. Yep. The monthly uh -huh. mortality rate, I can see that that would affect the susceptibles and the infectives. Yep. This is a great question. So uh, it's a great question. It's a question having to do with assumptions, okay? 
So the assumption here that I, I uh, had suggested, and I may have said it too quickly, was that um, we're going to assume that mortality here is just general sort of population mortality associated with population turnover. It's, well, it's not disease specific. It's not disease specific. Okay. Now we could have um, we could have a uh, a situation where we have the in, the mortality only being disease induced and would really concentrate on the infected stuff, you know. Or we could have a situation where we have both. We would add maybe another flow here to be you know deaths of infectives from infection, and that would have a mortality rate all its own, you know, associated with the infection. This reflecting the elevation in mortality associated with infection, whereas this one is just a general mortality, you know, that, that all people are mortal uh, and, and there's going to be deaths because of that. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, great, wonderful question. Other, other questions, what you've seen thus far? I, I really welcome them. So, so we're going to look at this whole issue of bursts now. So, um, so bursts is a little bit uh, different. What? So, if we're, if we're considering just again, sort of population demographics, vital statistics, sort of turnover of the population, deaths here of anyone from from natural causes on the one hand, or births. What would births depend on? Um, what? What? Those, by the way, those stocks are called state variables sometimes. Um, uh, so uh, those, what stocks would this guy ultimately depend on? What, what one of these would ultimately reflect the number of births? If we're, if we're thinking about just sort of a general population birth rate. Well, it turns out that we assume this is a fairly mild infection, so people aren't dying from it. Something like uh, like gonorrhea or uh, you know flu or what have you. Um, we can probably pretty reasonably assume that the number of people, the number of babies being born per month, is 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 pretty independent. You know, to a to a woman, say, is, is pretty independent of, of whether she's susceptible, infected, or recovered. So we're going to have the number of births per month depend on a birth rate, to be sure, but then a the total population. So anyone in the population can give birth is the idea. Um, we'll assume this is a mild infection. It would look quite different for very severe infections. So we're going to have to have a total population here, okay? Um, now I'm going to, this is a teachable moment, um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do something and then I'm going to backtrack and do it a different way. Um, first of all, I'm going to say birth rate. And we could make this fertility rate if we distinguish males and females in the population and so on. But for now, it's going to be a birth rate. Um, and ooh, to be conceptually clear, this is actually a monthly birth rate because we are computing things in months. If we were doing things in years, we would uh, be able to treat it as a yearly birth rate. And, hmm, maybe we should, maybe just for simplicity so we can think about it more clearly. I'm going to go to model settings. And I'm going to say, I want to do this in years, okay? Um, year. Okay, there we go. Okay, now we can change these. These will be, this will just be an annual birth rate, you know, and this will be an annual mortality rate. I just decide to change because it's easier for people to think about, okay? Um, okay, annual birth rate and then births. So births here, if we consider the number of births per month, 
Um, it's going to be the annual, depending on the annual birth rate, to be sure. And then I would say we're going to consider as if any one of these people could give birth, susceptible, affected, and recover. So if there's a uh, hundred individuals in the total population and the birth rate is two percent per year, how many births would there be on average per year? Hundred people, two percent per year. <laughs> Two births, two births per year. On your population, 10% birth rate per year. Bursting at the seams, um, that would be 10 births per year. So, so this is going to be annual birth rate. Now, I could, I could just do here. Okay, this is going to be susceptible. I choose variable, and that will simplify things. I'll do susceptible plus infectives. This is going to be the total population. Right? Um, I'm considering the total population. It's like no matter what state they're in, they're, they can give birth. So I could do that. But that's messy. And it's confusing. You have to look at that and kind of read through the logic. And I don't like that. So, so I'm going to come back to this in just a second. I'm going to create a variable that's called total population. Okay? Uh, I just go, went up here. And I click down here. So let's let's do that again. Let's rehearse that. Boom. Click. Uh, total population. Yeah? You know? What is the total population? Can anyone give me a formula for the total population? What things does it depend on? Total population. Sorry? Well, okay, it ultimately is going to depend on births and deaths, but at any given moment, where are people divided into in this model? Remember I said it very early on. People are divided into what categories? Any given point three, in time? Three. Yeah, these three. These three. So at any given moment in time, the total population, even though these may be varying according to factions and births, deaths, um, at any given time, the total population at that time is going to be the sum of what? That's right, and recovered individuals. That's what it's going to be. That's these are sort of the state of the system. That's why they're called state variables. Not in the sense of state funeral, but in the sense of it, it's kind of the memory of the system is susceptible and factor recovered. That's current state, okay? So the, the total population is going to be, is going to depend on them. So I'm going to hitch them up. Ready? Susceptible to total population, infective to total population, recovered to total population. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you see one of the reasons that I was trained as an engineer and not as an artist. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's looking ugly. And well, let's deal first with the sort of the formula, and then we'll deal with the, the aesthetics, OK? Um, uh, it's also why I'm dressed as I am. Um, OK, so let's click here, uh, equations. Let's go insert the formula here, OK? So this will be susceptible plus infected plus recovered, OK? There we go. OK, so that's our formula for total population. And now let's drag it to a place that befits its stature in life. Um, OK, so I just dragged it up here. And maybe I'll, I'll futz around a little bit so, so we don't have to dodge things. And oh, uh, we can actually drag these so they, they look, they look kind of nicer. Um, OK, so there we go. We have total population, and it depends on these three. And it's kind of nice visually. You can kind of just look at it and see what it depends on. You know, it's, it gives a bit of reassurance you know what's going on. OK, OK, so now we have total population. Now we can go back and revisit the formula for births. How many? Per year are there? Okay, so this could be the birth rate, like two percent times what? Times the uh, <coughs> total population. Yeah, yeah. So hundred people, two births per year. Thousand people, twenty births per year. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as that total population is going up, the number of births per per year will be going up. Okay. So annual birth rate. Oh, you know what? If you're using a free version of software, and I, I'm not, but I just let's get in good habits. So I just connected total population to births, and because because I'm paying more attention to aesthetics here, I'll, I'll make it curved. Okay, so uh, click on births. Uh, I'm going to say total uh, annual birth rate times total population. Let me let me just 
Because I wrote it the opposite order, I'll just be consistent. Okay, total population times times annual birth rate. So what that's saying here is going to depend on the total population, depend on the annual birth rate. The bigger this is, the bigger number of births per year. The bigger the annual birth rate is, the more births per year. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're in good shape. Okay. So we can say okay. Okay, boom. Okay, now we have to find the annual birth rate. I'm gonna say 2%. Oh, 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 no, I don't wanna add, oh, it, it thought it was a variable name and it said, do I wanna add it? No, okay. Okay, so there's one thing missing. There's one elephant in the room. Um, that's gotta be filled in. Okay, um, a point of advice. One of the more important principles I learned uh, in my many years of computer science education. A principle that even, even PhDs will forget from time to time. Save early and save often. Um, okay, so I just save that, okay? Um, okay, so now ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna need to fill in this, this final component. So we argued before that new infections has gotta depend on at least two stocks, two state variables. What are those two stocks? Yeah, and infection. So if there's no one who's susceptible to infection, no one should be getting infected. Rate should be zero. If there's no one infected to spread the infection, no one should be getting infected, right? Okay, so that's interesting. Now we're gonna have to describe it in a little bit more detail. In a, I'd like to use here a classic formulation, and I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back to um, to a uh, to a, sl a few slides here, just to walk you through the reasoning. Um, so the classic things uh, in in the sort of model uh, infectious disease transmission model, um, classic things on which the number of new infections depends. It depends on susceptibles for sure, and it depends on infected. But how does it depend on them? Well, let, let's assume that, let, let's think about this. If, if you had someone who was susceptible and they were holed up in their house, in a basement, no less, um, so they weren't in contact with any infected, would they be getting infected? No. If they went out in a bubble boy uniform for all their contacts with infectives, so they went around perfectly isolated from those infectives, so there was no, no chance that a pathogen from an infective with whom they are engaged in discourse, uh, there's no chance that they'll get get that pathogen into their system. Would they get infected? No. So, so when we're thinking about that rate of infection, surely it depends on the number of susceptibles and the number of infectives. Certainly. But it also depends something on how much they're contacting each other. And then when they do contact each other, what the chance is, you know, when they're when they're engaging in some form. And, and the form of that contact will vary by infection. What's the chance of transmission? So, so we're gonna have to consider those things. Now, when we say contact, I'm, I'm being deliberately uh, a little bit, a little bit ambiguous here. Um, uh, for different types of pathogens, different types of contact. If we were simulating um, the spread of STIs, it might be sexual contact. If you were simulating the spread of HIV, you might consider sexual contact or intravenous drug use. You're considering the spread of, of, of hep C. Similarly, uh, a lot of it comes through intravenous drug use uh, or uh, blood transfusions in some cases. Uh, if you're considering flu, you might be considering um, airborne transmission. People are near each other. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to consider contacts, and the, the notion of those contacts will differ according to the pathogen. And so, um, you know, if we're dealing with TB, what we mean by contact will be different than if we're dealing with chlamydia. 
Well, we could talk about a rate of contacts. And if that contact rate is zero, there's no contact between the susceptible on the one hand and the effective on the other. We're going to have no one getting affected. Mm -hmm. But then we have to consider that the chance when they do come into contact, when there's a sexual, a sexual contact between a susceptible and infected, for example, or a needle sharing contact, what the chances of transmission? <coughs> Sure, please. Uh, for taking, for example, disease like TB, yes. you are passive and active. Yeah. So where would you classify a great that uh, kind of person as suspected or infected? And then, because you are bringing something like isolation and non Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so there's two possible interpretations of your question. I'll try to cover both, okay? And then you can tell me if I'm still off it. Um, so within the TB context, uh, uh, we have a, an infection which is distinguished by a very long latent period. Um, latent period can last decades. Uh, it commonly lasts months or years. Between the time an individual is infected, and about one third of the world is infected by TB. And there's, that's to be contrasted for those with active TB disease. So often we get infected with TB, perhaps while we're young. Here in Saskatchewan, the burden of infection is, is in younger individuals. And uh, our immune system may respond to it aggressively and keep it bottled up, in, so to speak. There's things called a structure called granulomas, which form uh, in the lungs or other, other places in the body, which, which are sort of cysts that keep the TB bacteria contained so it doesn't spread within your body. And uh, we can keep it that way for years. And then sometimes because of adverse immune impacts, because of diabetes, because we're a renal transplant patient and we're taking immunosuppressant drugs, um, because of the depredations of old age and weakened immune system that comes with that, at some point our body can can no longer keep it contained, and it spreads to active TB. Um, now, so one interpretation of, of the question is, you know, how do we capture this distinction between, on the one hand, people who are infected but not active, and the other hand, active cases? And um, one general way of doing this, and it, for TB it's a little bit more, more textured, but one general way of doing it is you'd have a, a separate stop, a separate state variable, to be latently infected, and this would be active cases, and only the active cases would spread it, and the latently infected cases, they, they'd be infected, so they couldn't get, their chance of getting infected again is, is much smaller, but um, they wouldn't be spreading it. Yeah. And so you'd have a, and, and uh, often it's called an exposed class, someone who's, who's gotten infected, but they're not infected. They're not infectious yet. So, so that's one question. There's a second question with TB, which has to do with active and passive diagnosis methods, which is you know, whether they come in through presenting directly to a doctor, say complaining of a, a, of a uh, cough, um, uh, or you know, cough, uh, coughing of blood, what have you, versus a case where they're, they're found actively through screening or through contact tracing or, or other mechanisms. And we can actually represent those within a model of the sort we just mentioned with that stock broken out. And I'd be glad to show TB models after class if there's interest, because it's a big area of our, of our model. Okay. Um, does that address enough of your question right now? Well, yeah, the active aspect, I got it, but yeah. the passive is still What's after class? Okay, yeah. be glad to talk about that. Okay, so so we've been talking about these um, these new infections that that remaining black spot, and like Shakespeare, we wish to say out out black spot. Um, we <laughs> wish to eliminate that black spot, right? Um, so um, that was Macbeth. Um, okay, so uh, we want to introduce two things that reflect the considerations we talked about: the number of contacts, how much contact a susceptible is having with an infective, and then uh, per contact, what the chances of transmission. Now, uh, 
Sometimes these are combined together, but it's really useful to break them out because, among other things, different interventions affect different ones of these. Um, can anyone give me a, some examples of interventions that might affect the, the first of these, the, the contacts, per, the, the sort of the contact, amount of contacts that are going on between susceptibles and infectives? Exactly, quarantining of some sort. So isolating an infective uh, uh, might really reduce the amount of, of mixing that goes on between those two. So that's a great example. Um, another thing that goes on is, is known as, it's not an intervention, but it's a known effect called social distancing. So um, when, when there's a uh, concern about um, uh, the spread of infectious diseases, sometimes people circulate less. They hang out in their house. I mean, this is believed to have played a significant role in the 1918 flu epidemic, and it may explain some of the puzzling characters of, of the, uh, mortal uh, the uh, morbidity and mortality rate associated with that epidemic. So people isolate themselves. Um, you may give advisories, you know, to um, if, you, if you're sick, stay home. Have you ever seen those? I certainly have, and, and they advise people, like last year it was particularly pronounced, right? Stay home. So those sort of things might affect this one. See, there's other interventions that might lower the chance of transmission given contact. Can, can anyone give an example of that? Sorry? Hand washing. Yeah, hand washing is a great example for something like, uh, like uh, flu. So even if there's a, a contact, I shake this person's hand, I'm less likely to get infected. How about for sexually transmitted diseases? Okay. Yeah, condom use. Be, be a good example. Um, if you consider contacts in a case of HIV as including like uh, drug use, intravenous drug use together, this might include sort of use of, of um, safe needles, new needles rather than reusing of needles, something like that. Okay. So the reason we break them out is, is not merely for mathematical purity or something like that. It's because different things intervene uh, it, it change different of these interventions. And sometimes we can influence one more easily than the other, and we want to understand that effect. Okay. Mm. So that's a very interesting question. Now, um, generally speaking, so it's a wonderful question. Generally speaking, these are going to be transmission probabilities that apply for broad ranges of, of people. Um, in general, but you could, in principle, break it out that way. You could, and that's actually a, a, sort of an intriguing idea to represent it that way. Um, so there'd be a different transmission probability to vaccinated individuals than to other people. But it turns out we can we can simplify it uh, even more than that. So so we don't have to to even represent this chance of transmission for those individuals. So I'll try to show how we do this before the end of the. Okay, so um, questions on that before we introduce these? Yes? It's a question of vaccinated individuals. Where would they fit in those three categories? That's a great question. And the answer is wonderful question, and it pairs up with the earlier question. And the answer is we would create a fourth category. Um, there is an alternative, which is that you could call these folks immune. If, if indeed they're persistently immune. And you could have vaccinated people through vaccination go from here to here directly. And just you gloss over the fact whether they're immune because of natural exposure on the one hand versus vaccination on the other. Um, but generally it's broken out as a separate category. Amongst other things, vaccination efficacy is often below. So your level of protection from vaccination may be significantly below your level of protection from, uh, from natural exposure. So the immune, the strength of the immune system response may be much more, much stronger for those who are naturally exposed. And, and uh, the, the time until waning of that immunity is typically longer for natural exposure. So typically what we do is we, we keep those as recovered and we have another category um, and you know, visually you can put it up here, say vaccinated. Now, those vaccinated people will come from susceptible, and 
there wouldn't be getting infected, so there wouldn't be uh, infection link. Or, well, okay, if there's a lesser chance they're infected, they could still get, there'd be another flow here for vaccinated individuals with a lower beta, with a lower beta. And then a lower chance per contact that they get infected, right? And, um, and then those would, would, would flow there. But fundamentally, they'd be, if, if we're total, total success of vaccination, if it were perfectly efficacious, you wouldn't you wouldn't have the flow. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a, a different category, and that's very common. We see that in in a very a very large numbers of, of models of this. Okay. Okay. So we need to need to introduce this this variable here. So um, let's. So here are our two variables, uh, C and beta. Contacts per susceptible per. In this case, it would be year because we chose year. Okay. So we're going to introduce a contacts per susceptible per year. Yeah, this could be sexual contacts, for example, um, uh, per susceptible per year. And let's let's move that up there. And then and then likelihood of transmission per. And I'm going to use a fancy word here: discordant contact. Um, what do I mean by that? What I mean is if there's an, a susceptible that comes in contact with an infective, that's the chance that they'll get infected. Okay. Now, okay. Now we have to work through the reason for this. Okay. So let's go back to the to the slides. Okay, so we're gonna have these factors. Factors, susceptibles, this and this. And that's what it's gonna depend on. Okay? Um but we have to reason through. So let's, let's, and this is the most complicated part of this sort of transmission model. But once you know this formula, you'll just see this again and again and again with different masks on. It's just, this is the same silly formula. Well, it's not silly, the same formula again and again and again. Um, but this is the nonlinear formula. So see what these models, it's the complex formula. Okay. So, um, so let's think about a, uh, a susceptible. Okay, we're going to imagine a susceptible. Um, and they have contact with C people per unit you know, year. C sexual contact per unit. Okay, uh, that's who they have with anyone. So suppose they have 10 per year. And let's suppose I were to tell you 50% of the whole population is infected. On average, what number of contacts per year would they have with infected people? They have 10 with anyone. If 50% of the whole population is infected, what, what number of connections will they have per year with infectives? Five. That's right. And we can write that as, so, be clear, if we write n as the total population, susceptible plus infected plus recovered here, it would be susceptible plus infected plus recovered plus vaccinated if we break that out. I over n is the fraction of that total population that is infected, okay? Right? So, so I is the number of infectives. Oh, I should have said that. And n is the total population. So maybe the total population is 1,000, and 500 are infected, in which case i over n, so that's 50% of the whole population is infected, so it's i over n is 0.5, right? Okay. okay. C times i over n, so this is 10 contacts per year times i over n, 0.5, Five contacts per year will be in, with infectives. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. That's the contacts per year with infectives. So that's susceptible. C times I over contacts with infectives. And what's the chance per contact with an infective, or so called discordant contact, that they get infected? What's the fancy Greek term we gave for it? Beta. This guy here. Remember that? Certain chance they'll get infected per contact. For HIV infection, 
it's been estimated, it's actually different for male to female versus female to male, for example. Um, per needle sharing contact, it's, it's been estimated. Per, per uh, contact associated with proximity, you can estimate it. So, so this is beta. So C times I over N times beta is what's called force of impact. Let's, let's unpack that. C is their contacts with anyone, a susceptible has with anyone. C times I over N is the contacts per year they have with, uh, with an infected. And per contact with an infected, they have a chance, say, 10% of getting infected. So, or let's say it's 20%. Okay, so let's imagine our, our susceptible with 10 contacts a year total. 50% of the whole population is infected. So they have how many contacts with infectives per year? Five. And let's suppose it's a 20% chance. One out of five chance per contact that they got infected. Then they actually have a chance. It's actually, so uh, you, they have a very high chance of getting infected in the course of that year. This is called the force of infection. This is likely a, per year that a given susceptible will be, in, will be infected, okay? Um, very, very high chance that they're going to be infected. Some subtleties associated with it, but, um, but I'm not going to have time to go into them. So what, what we end up with here is this formula. If we consider chance per year that they're going to get infected, that each susceptible will get infected. And if they're S susceptibles, how many, so a thousand susceptibles, let's suppose, and let's suppose they have a 10% chance per year of getting infected, how many people would be getting infected in that year? thousand times 10% is 100, right? So the number of people getting infected will be susceptible times so-called force of infection, chance per year of getting infected. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the most complex stuff that goes into these models, the most complex type of reasoning. Um, so, so that's where this, this formula comes from. Now, um, we're going to create this in our model, OK? So, so let's, let's go up to our model. And, and pardon my poor aesthetics for the moment. I'll, I'll kind of move things around. But, but let's, let's see if we can put this into the model. OK, so um, first of all, we have our C. This is C. Hey, let's, let's, let's actually just say C here, right? C, just so it's, it's clear. And this is beta here. We're going to say beta, OK? Just so someone looking at it after the fact will we'll know what it is. OK, we're going to need to put in a formula like, like this one. This is S times the force of infection, the chance per unit time. Okay. So let's, let's begin. OK, so we have our C. Now we need to multiply C times I over N. What's the cor what, what corresponds to I in this model? In fact, and what's N? Total population. OK, so, so I could write I could write C times I over N for this. But I'm, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm, because I over N is a meaningful quantity. Can anyone describe to me what is I over N at an intuitive level? What does that mean? It's the, uh, there's a word for it in epidemiology. It's the prevalence, the prevalence of infection. Expressed as a, as a fraction, not as a percentage, but as a, as a fraction. So it's, a, it's the prevalence. So, so that's something we want to name, right? We might want to. We might want to look at what it's doing over time, for example. OK, so we're going to call this, I'm going to say fractional prevalence, be a bit wordy about it. But just to be clear what we have. OK, so give me the formula for that. What does it depend on? Let's draw the arrows to it. What does it depend on? OK, okay. Uh, someone? Uh, give one thing. Total population is one thing. And what's another thing? Number of factors. Okay, good. And what's the formula for it? In terms of those? Yeah, it's it's just that. Well, okay. Another fractional prevalence, right? Okay. Now we can choose 
whether to put down this whole formula together or whether to break it up into this force of infection thing here. How many people want to have a force of infection variable? How many people would just want to write this formula like that? Okay, so, so just put it down there directly. Okay, you got it. Um, okay, so to appease the Vensim PLE god, you need to draw these things, so, so boom. Um, we just drew from susceptible to there. What else is this gonna depend on? It's gonna depend on C, this thing I over N, which is the fractal prevalence and the beta. Okay, so, so boom, boom, boom. Um, one thing you learn about classes is side is sort of sound effects. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so this guy is kind of bent in a weird way. Um, not that it matters, but uh, let's see if, oh, oh man. Um, can't you, come on, oh, there you go, okay. Um, okay, um, okay, so the number of people per year we're gonna be getting infected is the number of susceptibles times the chance per year they'll get infected. That's, that's, that's what we saw on this slide here. Um, susceptibles, so it's, it's just like those other things, right? Just like susceptible times mortality rate is the number of susceptibles dying per year. Suscept the number of susceptibles getting infected per year is susceptible times force of infection. Okay. So uh, this is the chance per year they'll get infected. So susceptible times, and this force of infection, let's unpack it, it's C. The contacts per year they have with anyone, right? times the fractional prevalence times the likelihood of transmission per discordant contact. That, and that, that's beta there, okay? Yes? It's a great question. So there are certainly estimates that you can find for many, many conditions for C and beta's in different contexts. Now, of these two, the one that's more biologically rooted is beta because it, it has to do with the, the transmission biology of, of it often, right? Um, given that you're sharing a needle or given that there's a sexual contact um, without condoms or what have you, uh, you're gonna have probably a, a pretty similar uh, beta. And if you're using condoms, you know what that is. But, um, but, but contacts per susceptible per year often that's going to differ for different populations. And so there may be one for representative populations, populations that you believe are similar to yours and you might use them. On the other hand, you might have some information from uh, people, from survey results or something that lets you understand something about uh, you know, sexual mixing in your community. And you try to use that if possible. Okay? So uh, it's a great question and where possible, we try to use primary data from, from our uh, area. Where that's not available, we will try to draw it from other sources. And there's a final technique known as calibration, which is all about if you don't have a very good estimate for certain things in your model, you try to best fit the model results to the data you observe. Sometimes you know a lot of different data on pieces of the model, and you try to get to simultaneously match those pieces. Okay. So, so great question. Now we have to fill these in, and then we'll have a runnable model. model okay, contact per susceptible per year. I'm going to say ten. Okay, um, and then uh, likelihood of transmission per discordant contact. I'm going to say uh, 0.4. Mm -hmm. um, and mean time until treated. I can't remember what I said. I, I said uh, one uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's a year, um, a full year. So if we want to make it a month, we can make it one over 12, right? Um, okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna increase the number of susceptibles for, for reasons that, are, uh, that, that will become clear. I'm gonna uh, increase that. And actually, even that, um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, increase this. Uh, oh, so that was, Oh, it's 0.4, okay, wow. 
Okay, that's much bigger than I thought. Okay, well, that's fine. Let's let's reduce that to. Uh, uh, no, we can keep it there. Okay, so let's. Uh, so now this is runnable. I'd like to suggest we set the birth rates and the death rates to uh, zero for now. Well, okay. Well, we can run this model. Let's 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 run it. Okay. So, um, ooh, look at that. So it is having a problem. Um, I just ran it using this running man, and it just caused a problem. What's the nature of its problem? Let's go click on infectives. So we've just transitioned from building the model to using the model. Let's be very clear about that. So I told it, hey, run this model. In other words, given these assumptions that we specified, go figure out what it means over time, and it takes care of that. Okay, just like Excel takes care of calculating all your formulas. It takes care of doing the runs. But sometimes it has a problem. And when I did running man, it said it had a problem computing new infections. Let's go see what new infections are doing. Okay. And oh my gosh, the number of infections is, is growing. Okay, so there must be some issue here. And I think I know what it is. Let's go look at the susceptibles. Ah, susceptibles have gone negative in a big way. Well, let me let me change one thing here and I'll tell you why I think I'm going to make a mean time till treated of one and now I'm going to run that. Okay, we're still having some trouble. Okay, um, so uh, I am going to make this simulate it more carefully and in order to do that we 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 change how how finely it simulates. This is sort of the level of quality of simulation. Now it runs just fine. Okay. So that's what I suspected. It just wasn't simulating it quite closely enough. Let's go look at the number of infectives. Okay, so who can say, if we, given that we have here, what do we think the number of infectives will do over time? Sorry? Okay, increase. Now, will it increase without limit? So, so, so what's the maximum this could possibly be? So if I told you the population size was 1,000, what's the maximum this could conceivably be? A thousand. It couldn't be more than 1,000, right? And it can't be less than zero. You can't, can't have negative infectives. Um, you could have an, an, an infected with a negative affect, but you can't have a negative <laughs> count of infectives. What's that? Okay. Can't be more than the population. It cannot be more than the population. Yeah. So if we have a population of 1,000, it cannot be more than that. And it can't be less than zero. So, so we know we can't go up without limit. Do you think, let's suppose we look at it early on. Let's suppose we look at it at the start. Would it be high or low? Remember what its initial value was? One. So early on, it'll be low. After that, it will rise. What are we, if we look far enough out, what do we expect the value to be? Sorry? So if we look far enough out, what do you think its value? Will it be big or small? Okay, okay. So there's lots of things going on here. Okay, certainly more people are getting affected early on, more and more and more. But what's also happening? Recovery. Treatments occur, right? And because treatment's occurring, that's draining the number of infectives. This is building up and this is draining it. At the same time, you have new births. You have new births going on, and we left those births in there. So we have new people coming in here. So this susceptibles is not being depleted, right? Okay, so a bunch of things going on. Um, I could take bets, but let's cut to the chase. Um, okay, the number of infectives it looks like it starts high, and then it goes down, and then it rises. Okay, now that's an interesting thing. Let's go zoom in on what's going on early on, okay? Um, ooh, excuse me, I should have uh, been more careful about that. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this part of the graph. Oh, gosh, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong key here. I should be pressing Shift and the left button. Okay, let's go look at, oh, okay, so it starts small. What would you call the sudden rise in the number of infectives? Sorry? It's an epidemic. 
<coughs> does it go to a small fraction of the population or a large fraction? Large, neat, very large. And then it decreases. Does it decrease without limit? That's, that's about 3.6. That was a zoom in on just this little portion in here. Where does it go out here? It starts recovering again. Why, did, why is that going up later? Yeah, new susceptibles are, are coming in. What's that? So, so the new susceptibles are coming in and building up infectives. Okay, so let's go see what the, what the um, population is, is doing as a whole. Um, so uh, total population, we're gonna double click on this and let's go, let's go see what its value is, okay. So first of all, what's mortality? Let's go down, remind ourselves, what's mortality? 0 0.001, what's birth rate? 0 0.02, what do you think the population is doing? Increasing, it's increasing, okay. So let's go see that, oh gosh, yeah. The population is rising over time. Okay, um, so that's part of what's going on in terms of the total number of people who are infected. Uh, do you think this rise means the fraction of people who are infected is rising? What did we call the fraction of people that are infected? Yeah, fraction, okay, so double click on this, go click over here. Fractional prevalence actually goes very high early on, and then it declines, and then it stays at a pretty low level, actually. So. So the number of people infected was rising over time, later on, but the fractional prevalence stays low. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so that's interesting. Let's go look at the number of recovered people. What do you think this is doing over time? Where does it start? Okay, well, so what's its initial value, of the, the, the initial number that start recovered? Anyone remember what we put Zero. there? Zero. If we go click on this, do equation mode, click on it. Remember it's zero, yeah? Okay, so so let's go Let's go look. So, so it starts at zero. Where do you think it goes from there? Does it just stay at zero? Where does it go? Up. Okay, does it go up instantly? Okay, why does it take time? Okay. Okay. Starting the immunity stage after recovery. Okay, so if we go look at new infections, that takes a bit of time to, oh gosh, it's very close. Maybe we should simulate it for a smaller period of time. It's all compressed way in this area over here. Let's go, let's go zoom in on that. Okay, so early on it's low and then it, it rises and then it comes down. So we would expect the number of people recovered to be uh, not immediately rise, but it rises pretty quick. Okay, uh, looks something like that. That's a number of people recovered. <coughs> so early on it's zero, and then it takes some time for the people to get infected and treated. It rises, and then slowly it's just accumulating people who are getting treated over. Okay, now there's a lot of things going on here. One of the virtues of these models is the world is a complex place, but we're not, it's, it's you know, sovereign, at least I'm not. Um, so we can't change things willy-nilly in the world. Uh, among other things, it may be infeasible, unethical, you know, uh, too expensive, but we can change things in little models of the world like this very easily. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the birth rate and death rate to zero. Okay, um, I'm gonna make them zero. Annual birth rate zero, annual mortality rate zero. Now in a real model, I probably wanna go remember, okay, what were they before and be able to restore them easily. But um, we're gonna say now uh, uh, no births or deaths, you know, default parameters. Okay, this is the name of a run. This is the name of a simulation that I'm gonna do with this model. And I can do many simulations with the same model, asking different what-if questions. 
if I change this variable to this, if I had a lower birth rate, if I had a higher death rate, if I had a less chance of transmission per contact, if I had fewer numbers of contacts, if I had faster treatment, those are all readily done, or you know, examine uh, vaccination, for example. So I'm going to run this out, no births or deaths. I'm going to simplify our thinking about it. Okay, it just ran it out for a long time. We might need to, to zoom in on, on a piece of it, but let's go see. Anyone want to bet with no births and no deaths? What do you think, what do you think the fractional prevalence will do? If, if we know it starts low, right? Because only one person's initially infected by the population of a thousand. What is it going to do from there? It's going to and go up. Is it going to go up also to a large fraction of the population? Okay uncertainty about that. And after that, is it going to stay up? Okay. It's going to go down. Because there's only a fixed number of people here now. It's going to go down. And how far is it going to go down? It's going to go basically to zero. Because the fuel has been used up, so to speak. You know, the fire can burn for a while, but once it's got no susceptibles to burn anymore, actually, be more careful about it. Once it's got, it doesn't have enough susceptibles to burn, to spread anymore, it's going to die down. There's a, there's a very good reason for all of this. Um, so let's go look at fractional prevalence. Okay, so it died, and this is the blue one. The, uh, the red one was with births and deaths. The blue one just goes down, and let's, let's zoom in on this. I might start running this for a shorter period of time. So this is, it, it, it rises, and it, look, it, it looks basically the same as with births and deaths. For the, yeah, does that make sense? That, like for the first year or two, it's almost the same? Yeah, it does, because after all, there's not 2% birth rate. There's not a huge number of births coming in. It hasn't had time to change it. With births and deaths, it kind of keeps it elevated. After all, there's, no more, there's still fuel for the fire being brought in. New delivery of logs, sir. Um, but uh, here, we have it going down declines and declines until basically it's zero. Let's go look at let's go look at recovered. What do you think recovered are going to compare to before? What do you think it's going to look like? Okay, so it's going to go up. Will it go to zero? Okay, so it's going to go to just about a thousand. Why to a thousand? What does that mean if it's if, if recovered was about a thousand? What does that mean? It means all the population has gotten immune because they've been exposed. The attack rate has been won. It's basically affected everyone in the population. Okay, so that's that's kind of interesting. Now I just drew it. I just. Um, diagram that out for the first little bit. And I'd like to focus on the first couple of years because things are playing out pretty darn quick. So I'm just going to simulate 10 years worth, okay? 10 years worth, and we're going to rerun. Boom. Okay. Quick. Okay. Now, it turns out that we can, this is just one nice feature of NSIM, we can actually turn into what's called a SINSIM mode which is where we can adjust these things live and see the results, okay? So, um, let's suppose we were to decrease the mean time until people are treated. We treat people more quickly. Maybe we do that through faster contact tracing. Maybe because we, we're screening people, maybe we're, we've got advisories out urging people to present to their doctor if they have any of certain symptoms. But let's suppose we could catch people more quickly once they're infected. Is that going to help or hurt in terms of the burden of infection? Do you think? Helps. Okay, helps. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what the effects would be on fractional prevalence? Will it be will its effect be delayed like we saw before? No. Okay. So so let's let's use a value of 0.12. Oh, sorry. 1 divided by 12, which is 0 0.0825, I think. Oh, 0833, excuse me. I think that's right. Um, in my youth, I knew it. Um, okay, so uh, let's go look. Okay, so we can go around and we can see. Okay, there, look at that. That's the number of infectives, eh? 
a number of recoveds. Um, this is going to be a fruitful thing to look at. Let's go look at the number of infectives. So number of infectives goes up and then goes down. So the peak, is there still an epidemic going on? Is there still an outbreak going on? First year, there's still one, and then it comes down. But it only goes to something like maybe 350 people, something like that, 375. And then it comes down. It's a lot smaller than before, right? OK, how about the number of recovered people? What do you think that's going to go up to? You think it's going to go up to 1,000 again? Do you think everyone will have gotten infected at one point or another? OK, let's go click on this. OK, now that's interesting. It does go up to fairly close to that, but there are some people who never got infected. It's actually a little gap there. And let's go see over in the susceptible, what should we see? If, if not everyone got infected, what should we see over in susceptibles? There's some remaining susceptibles. And look, there we go. We started about 1,000 susceptibles, right? 999. It came down, and then it kind of plateaus out. And those are the survivors. Those are people who never got infected. But wait a minute, there's still fuel there. Why didn't they get infected? No, they're not immune. Those are, those are as susceptible as the next person. So there are some remaining people. Why? Yeah, it's herd immunity. In this case, it's not vaccine-induced herd immunity, but it's naturally-induced herd immunity. There's few enough people who are susceptible anymore that the infection can't spread efficiently. So the infection starts to get smaller and smaller. And this, there's, there's fewer infected people. They infect even fewer new people infected, which drives the number of infected people even smaller. After all, there's still recovery going on. And basically, the number of infectives goes to zero. And then there's still some susceptibles remaining. It's just there's too few of them for the infection to really stay to be sustainable in the population, to remain in the population effectively. So the number of susceptibles is small. Now, if you wanted to look at it quantitatively, you can go click on this table. And actually, here are each of these each of these uh, runs we've done, each of these scenarios. And you can go look out 10 years, the number of susceptibles remaining with, with uh, this situation where we have very rapid treatment. We have about 30 susceptibles remaining. Uh, for the original one, where we had bursts and deaths and all sorts of things, we had just over that. But for the case we saw earlier where very slow treatment, basically everyone, this is times 10 to the 19th. So there's, there's very, very, there's essentially no susceptibles anymore. OK, so that's interesting. And in this case, it's a fixed population. So the fractional prevalence goes up and comes down, too, like that. Um, OK, so that's, that's one sort of thing we could vary um, in an intervention, potentially. What's another thing we could vary in an intervention? Well, we, we might do something and put, put it on an advisory that people not go to work if they're in fact shops or something. So re maybe we'd reduce the number of contacts, say, that a, a susceptible or an infected will have per year. This is actually contacts per, it says per susceptible, but it's for either of them. So we, we could reduce that. Um, how do you think that would change things? Well, it turns out that it, it also can reduce the burden. But these things aren't always obvious. I mean, in this case, here's, here's the number of infectives we just saw. Now, this is very different than what we saw earlier, right? When we, when we reduced the treatment time, what did we see? How is that different than this one? Let's, let's go give it a name. Let's go give these things two different names. Let's call this one fast, um, we'll, we'll call this uh, low 
um, uh, so low mixing, okay? And then let's call the other one. Hey, hey, run this thing, buddy. Um, okay, press enter. Boom, run. Okay, now let's go go back and say fast treatment, okay? And we're going to reset everything. And uh, we reset it. It set it back to 100. And we go here, mean time till treated, 0833, I think is what we said. Um, and there we have this uh, fast treatment, okay? So now we can compare these things. We've given them different names. Before we were using the same name and just overriding. Let's go, let's go take a look, okay? Here's, uh, here's the two cases. So this is with fast treatment. This, by contrast, in red, is for um, low mixing. So, so what's different between the two? Yeah, one's, one's delayed. Do, do you think both reduce the burden of infection? Let's, let's go check out the number of recovered people. That, after all, gives us a, an indication of sort of how many cumulatively have gotten infected, right? Let's go, let's go grab that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's look at blue. Okay, so, so we have default parameters, which are black. No births and deaths, default parameters. That's the black one. Okay, no births and deaths, and it goes up to some limit. Okay. Blue is with fast treatment. How does that differ from the black? Well, it turns out that if you, if you go look at it, it has a lower, here we'll do a little table of this. It has actually a lower number of cumulative people who got infected, nine, um, so uh, it's the fast one, the blue one, uh, fast treatment, 970 versus 999. So we spared about 29 people, around 30 people. We spared them. Um, we spared them getting infected. Okay, by fast treatment. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, how about the case of the um, the low mixing, this uh, this uh, green one, or sorry, the red one. What what happened there? Anyone describe? This is recovered, and this is the total number recovered here. Nine seventy nine. Which was more effective in reducing the total number of people who got sick at some point or another? Yeah, faster treatment actually meant fewer people got sick. Low mixing, how, how did it compare with, with the case of sort of normal mixing? It did reduce the burden by about 20 people, but, but still a large, large fraction of this got, still got infected, right? Okay, same thing for this, even a large, large, large fraction got infected. Okay, um, so that's interesting. We largely delayed the epidemic. Now, why might that be important? Delaying. I mean, it, it sounds like, well, it's, okay, you delayed it, but you didn't prevent it. Big deal. But actually, delaying it is important in certain contexts. That contexts that aren't yet captured in this model, but which we could capture. Why might delaying it and spreading it out, compared to, say, this one, why might that be, be helpful? Are you trying to uh, intervene? Yes. To, to intervene more effectively, he's right. Um, so uh, that is uh, that is interesting. Int uh, question for you: Why is the blue going up so quickly here? What? Why is it? Are, are we making this epidemic play out sooner? Why is it rising so rapidly? For, for the case where we have fast treatment. The course of the disease is getting shorter. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're offering faster treatment. So 
more, we more quickly see a lot of recovery control. That's not a bad thing. In fact, if we go look at the number of infectives here, number the, the fractional prevalence of infection for these three cases, um, we did we did reduce the number that were infected at any given time. This is also important, right? If we're dealing with emergency room crowding and so on. Reducing this this burden in, is is really really helpful. Um, we, we reduced the, the maximum number that, that got infected. Um, and this is still a situation where we have uh, the infection occurring uh, sooner. But this fast treatment is yielding getting people to recover sooner rather than, rather than circulating in the infection, um, rather than circulating and infecting others. So, Please, this yes. Is, this is the basis of the new approach for HIV control and prevention. Because they just started, uh, the, the WHO mm. uh, uh, suggested to start uh, treatment for uh, HIV positive people huh. soon, fast. That's so, interesting. Yeah. So the, 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 the number of cases yeah. says that. Uh, reduced by one to each year. Hmm. Uh, that's very, very interesting. I, I hadn't been aware of that change, so quite quite interesting. Okay, we're going to do something different. I mentioned nonlinearity being relating to like the interaction of interventions. Sometimes the effects of two interventions together can be very different than the sum of their effects independently. Let's just let's just take a look at that. Okay, so what we're going to simulate now is fast treatment and lower mixing. Okay. Okay. I've just typed that up there. Now we got to go change the parameters. Okay. Come on. Do this. Okay. So we're going to change mean time until treated to be that about one month. And we're going to reduce contact for susceptible to 10. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go. Let's go see what's going on here. Okay. So. What we have here is a situation where we have we have slightly shifted the, the timing of this, but we and we've also reduced you know, for a very long time, somewhat reduced the number of people getting recovered. But the infection is is uh, still spreading in the, in the population. If we were to undertake a yet uh, more drastic thing and being able to use, say, uh, the beta coefficient here, let's, let's go take a look at that situation. Okay, there the number of infectives rises, but it rises over a very, very long time frame and starts to decline. And what we will actually see for the number of recovered is, in fact, very, uh, the number of recoveries is only gradually going up over this uh, time frame of, of the simulation. Okay, so what we're dealing with here is a situation where we have a an epidemic that's that's playing out or an outbreak that's playing out at different scales, and the parameter values are shaping that in important ways. Um, oh, you know what I forgot to do here. Um, this was, I said 0.8, that's actually not one, yes. Okay, so we're gonna actually change this to be uh, 0.0833. Okay, now let's go look at the results of that, okay? So so let me, let me reset this just so I only get these two together, the 10. And so that was one intervention we did by in isolation. And then do this, 0.0833, okay? And now let's go look at the results. Okay, so let's go look at the fractional prevalence. So what I've just done is I've combined together in a single intervention two things that were done independently. One, which was focused on fewer contacts, reducing that from 100 to 10, and on the other, reducing mean time until treated from one to this. And I've done them together, okay? We saw what the effects were independently. They, they made some difference in the number of being infected, but not a, a huge amount. 
let's go see what happens when they're done together. Okay, so let's go look at the fractional prevalence. And uh, we're looking for the blue. So where is the blue? Okay, so we recognize these before. This is fast treatment by itself, right? And this was, so that was the, making that treatment one month rather than a year. And the green, that's low mixing. That was reducing from 100 to 10. Now we've done both together. So where, where's the, where's the blue? Hmm. There's a blue tinge there. Could that be the blue? Okay, let's let's go let's go take a look at recovered. What's going on with recovered? Where where's the blue? Well, that axis looks a bit blue. Let's go let's go use the table. Eyes are deceiving. Okay, we're gonna click on this again. That becomes kind of the current variable. I could do a graph or I could do table. Let's go to table. Okay, and let's go all the way to the end after ten years. Fractional prevalence is tiny. This is 10 times e to the instead of 10 times to the minus 41. Um, so it's it's basically non-existent. Well, how could that be? Wait a minute. Then, and let's go see a number of recovered. How many recovered people do you think there are? Well, the others said you know 970, 979. It's 1.49. Well, that can't be below one. Why not? Why can't that be below one? We had one person started infected. So how many people did they infect on average? About, well, if one person, if one of, of this one person was just the original person we started infected, how many other people did they infect? Half, about half of another person on average. Ooh. so. So they didn't even get someone to replace them before they recovered, so to speak. They, they infected on average half a person, but they didn't in, infect anyone else. Okay, so, so what's going on here? What's going on here? Let's look at the number of people who are infective at any given time. It starts, for all these runs, it starts at one. What happens, ladies and gentlemen, for this run with both interventions together? When we combine those two interventions, they were considered in isolation. We combine them together. What happens, well, with the others, let's, let's ignore the, the blue for the moment. What happened with the others when, when we started simulating? Did it go up or down, the number of people who were infected? Up. These just numbers just rise in any given rush. Rise, rise. Sometimes they rise very quickly. Behold, the red in the last two. But sometimes they rise more slowly, but they inexorably, in a grim progression, lead to an, an outbreak. For the top, the blue, we see what? A decrease. Eradication. Eradication. The, the infection is not sustainable at that level. If you're only, if an infected is only mixing on average with 10 people, and if they're recovering that quickly, they're gonna replace themselves with, they're, they're on average not even gonna replace themselves with anyone before they recover. And what that means is that uh, the infection might jump to one or two people and so on, but those people won't be able to spread it efficiently either. And Chances are that for each of them, they infect less than one person. Chances are they don't infect anyone to replace them. And that leads to the infection dying out. It may die out immediately, or it may die out after a few people, but die out it does. It's as if you have a few logs that could burn in a fireplace, but the rest are wet. And they're not surrounded by enough, their space too far apart. And it kind of catches the first log or two, but but it, it points out. So that was the R0 that we were talking about. That was the right? basic so reproductive number. Yeah. Yeah. 
and and just to to link that in there, if we were to think about this in terms of basic reproduction, R zero. Let's think about this to some. Let's, let's think about a given infected. Imagine they're surrounded entirely by susceptibles. They fly into the Saskatoon airport with Ebola, and no one's had it before. Okay. They're in contact with, for the default model, for the default model, they're in contact with how many people per year? A hundred. Mm -hmm. And me, I'm until treated for the default model was one. And their likely of transmission per contact was 0.4, okay? So 100 people per year with whom they're in contact, they're infected for that full year, so 100 times one times 0.4, that's the chance each of those 100 people will get infected over that course of that full year. That's what 100 times one times 0.4 is 40. That's an R naught, uh, R zero of 40. Is that above one? So the infection's gonna spread. Now, when we played around with changing that, we lowered the contacts per susceptible from 100 to 10. Now we have 10 times 1 times 0.4, okay, which is what? 4. We lowered R naught to 4. Hey, that's pretty good. But a large fraction of that population. We increased the, we lowered the mean time control treatment. So they were only infected for a smaller amount of time. So now they're in contact with 100 people per year, but they're only effective for a month. just over three people, 3.2 people or so. So that kept our not above one. The infection still had an outbreak. We saw that. And a large fraction of the population still got infected. Ooh. So, so then we did both together. And so then we had 10, 10 people per year. They were infected for, ooh, it was 0.18. It should be 0 0.8 and so on. Times the chance per contact of 0.4. These two combine to be 4. 4 times 0 0.8 is about point, point 0.32 or so on. Um, 0 0.32 or so on. Is R not less than 1 or above 1? Now less than one. The infection dies out, and that's what we saw happen. Now, uh, had we time, I could add a vaccinated stock. I could have people flow from there to the vaccinated stock. We could distinguish men and women, have susceptible infected recovered spread separately from men and women. If you say you had sexually transmitted infection, there were different characteristics of chance of transmitting it. We could take into account deaths from the infection by adding a flow here. We could have people be distinguished by age and sex and ethnicity or other risk, uh, risk factors. We could <coughs> further refine the model by including sophisticated representation of immigration, of health systems effects. The sky's the limit. But I think you get a little bit of a sense of the the value of these things as kind of micro worlds to ask what if questions. Say, if we could affect this via an intervention or affect that. And sometimes we represent those interventions in quite detailed ways, the time necessary to make it come into place, aspects.
sense of, of program planning and evaluation you would have seen in other classes. We could add costs into the model, have a cost each time someone is treated or a cost for treatment of an infected per month. We could add quality of life into the model, capturing not only loss of life years, but loss of quality of life, so that we seek interventions that not only add years to life, but add life to years. We could do all these things with these sort of models. I hope it's been a little bit of an introduction to uh, how you build it in this sort of software, the sort of things that you can do with it. And uh, uh, it sounds like Cheryl will be, uh, be building on this understanding in the coming class. Sure. Good. Any any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, great pleasure. Thanks for your attention. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh, oh. oh I just had a data stick with me. I figured rather than having to email all this crap to me, it's, if it's too late, that would that would be pretty useful. Yeah, actually, that would. Have, and there wasn't that. You know, in terms of listening to recording, there wasn't that many sort of interruptions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess recording it um, there. So, uh, one person who had a doctor's appointment today who had, this, uh, who had a doctor's, doctor's appointment. appointment. I see. Okay. Um, okay. So let's let's just see if this thing is. Um, Last week it was way too hot here. They just 